evolve into solution very rapidly at that depth. What anybody who's explored the wreck finds is pairs of shoes. While traveling in first class it might feel more comfortable at first, but when it came to the sinking of the Titanic, first class passengers had a better chance at survival. You would think obviously, but here's why. Just over 200 first class passengers survived out of the 324 souls traveling in first class during that fateful voyage. That's a lot of people. I mean, a lot of people passed away, but in hindsight, a lot of people made it. If you've seen the James Cameron film, you know women and children were first to board these lifeboats. And then afterwards, it was first class men. See, by that point, there were few lifeboats left, which I'll get into, of course, later on. But second class and third class, their chances at survival here, right off the bat, were not great, simply because they were divided by class. Being stored further and lower from these lifeboats, the odds weren't in their favor. There were more than 700 third class passengers, and that number exceeded the other two classes combined. It's horrible. Those rooms were crammed. Four people would have to share one tiny room and the beds were smaller than twin beds. So when it comes to evacuating quickly, sadly these passengers had the hardest time getting out, which we don't often think of when we think of, you know, the Titanic and the sinking of it. Number nine, the band. We know how passionate musicians can be and we know that music can heal a lot of people, of course. While I'm absolutely sure there is nothing that could have been done to completely erase people's worries about what was about to happen on the Titanic that fateful night, the ship's orchestra did what they could, which was to play music. And I'm sure that it helped somebody in some way, shape, or form. It wasn't just in the movie. Movie, right? The eight orchestra members continued to play as the ship sank in order to try and keep spirits up. First, it was widely believed that they did this because they were ordered to, and for the record, if this were the case, that still would have been insanely brave of them too, but it turns out this is far from the truth. See, the band members were in fact not ship employees at the time, which means they technically had the same rights as any other passenger to leave and board a ship, but they chose not to. They all unfortunately passed away in the sinking of the ship, and they played until they couldn't anymore, which I think is horribly sad sad, but also very beautiful and heroic of them. The film can't quite capture the beauty. I'm sure that their heroism helped a lot of people who are also in this terrible situation, and I'm glad their acts have been remembered, even still. Number eight, locked doors. Ellen Hakarian was aboard the Titanic that fateful night, and Tanky Magazine actually published her survival story afterwards, titled, Going Down with the Titanic in Third Class. Yeah, I mentioned the first class differences between third class, so this story here is already a feat in itself. Ellen and her husband, Pecco, decided to leave Finland and start a new life in America. The night of April 14th, after the couple had returned to their cabin and got settled in, they heard a loud scraping sound, and the engines then started to act up. Pecco ran out to see what was going on. The hallway was tilted by the time Elin poked her head out moments later, once she heard a ruckus in the hallway. Then there was a knock at the door. One of her friends from Finland came in, and they said the ship was sinking, but Pecco was nowhere to be seen, and her friend asked, how did he get out of the passageway? All the doors are locked. I was confused. I didn't know what to do next. After a few moments, I grabbed my purse and life jacket and ran out to the passageway. The door was locked. All the doors were locked. A steward finally came along to guide the crew to third deck, where they were then taken to the Carpathia, and they didn't arrive to a safe ship until the sun was up the following day. So after losing her husband and all of her belongings, Ilan only received $125. That's all the ship could give them. They're like, we're sorry you lost everything. Here's the best we can do. That's it. Number seven, no binoculars. On that fateful night of the collision with the iceberg, binoculars were locked up the entire time. Now, of course, this could have changed literal history had they have been used, but why weren't they? The key to set lockup, storing the binoculars, was being held by Officer David Blair. Only before the Titanic's departure from Southampton, Officer Blair was pulled from the crew. Now, of course, this may not have made a difference at all, but it's important to note. To think that these were stashed in a locker in the crow's nest the entire time is haunting, now when you consider the history of it. The poor guy was trans transferred to another ship and forgot a key. The amount of times I've forgotten a key or taken a work key home by accident, I mean, it's a simple mistake, but in this case, tragedy, really. Number six, ignored flares. Just 20 miles away from where the Titanic sunk, there was another boat. This one was called the SS Californian. This boat had stopped in order to avoid the ice, and the crew on the Titanic had also received warnings about icebergs. The Titanic had received six warnings about icebergs before the collision. Now, while the first few warnings were received by the captain, not all six were. Why so? The captain of this other boat, he slowed down and actually saw the emergency flares being set off on the Titanic ahead, but he ignored them because he thought that they were company rockets. 
The SOS signals that the Titanic was sending out weren't received until the next day because the radio operator on that SS Californian had gone to sleep. Yep, he took a little power nap after ignoring all the flares. By the time they had heard these calls and arrived the next day, it was obviously too late, sadly. Number five, less lifeboats. Before the Titanic even set sail during the preparation for the journey, at some point, people made a decision to reduce the number of lifeboats that were on board. Why they did this? Beats me, I don't know. They did this because they didn't want to clutter the deck, which is truly trivial when we're talking about the safety of, I don't know, 2,208 passengers that were on board that day. The number of lifeboats ended up being reduced to just 20, with an additional four that were, you know, collapsible. So 24-ish lifeboats, 2,208 passengers. Doesn't add up, it's not, uh, it's a terrible ratio. Which means they should have had time to launch every single one, but this would still be only enough for half the passengers on board. It was cursed from the get-go. And as you may or may not know, during the sinking of the ship, not even all the lifeboats were able to be launched as everything happened too quickly, and it was chaos. There are quite a few lessons that can be definitely learned from the sinking of the Titanic, because the more we learn, the more we realize that safety precautions taken for these ships simply were just not up to par. It wasn't really about the iceberg. I mean, I mean, that did it, but there were other things that could have helped. Number four, the card. In the remnants of the Titanic, there was an inspection card found that belonged to a woman named Marianne Meanwell. This must seem like any ordinary find after a wreck, but it revealed a grim story for the woman. Once the card was found, it was then revealed that Marianne was not intended to be on the Titanic at all, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers. The card shows us that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic, but for some reason, the trip she'd originally planned was delayed, and she instead was a signed to the ill-fated Titanic. You can see the word majestic was actually crossed out on her card, which shows us the change in plans. It's, it's so haunting to look at now. There's no way anybody could have known or warned her. It's just a really tragic situation to look back on. And to physically see the cancellation of the ship gives me goosebumps. That's really horrible. Number three, Eliza Melvina Dean. This story really is something. Okay, buckle up. When thinking back to this tragedy, it's hard to imagine how it looked in real time, like being on the ship, right? I mean, you know, not from James Cameron's perspective, right? It was a moonless night in the pitch black. Of course the navigation was hard, of course it could have been handled better, or they could have listened to the numerous warnings, but again, it was pitch black. This is what the iceberg looked like in real life. Eliza Dean was only a newborn on the Titanic. Her parents were on the way to the States with everything that they owned packed up in their luggage. See, Eliza's father was actually on the deck at the time of the collision, so he saw the ship hit that iceberg. How terrifying is that? But in doing so, he knew in that moment, get the family, hit the deck, something bad's gonna happen. Even as third-class passengers, they were thankfully some of the first on the lifeboats, which is incredible seeing as what I said earlier. It was Eliza, her brother, and her mother. They all got aboard safely, but her father, of course, never made it off, which is terrible, but his quick thinking saved his family. Number two, John Jacob Astor. As the ship was sinking, the first class passenger, John Jacob Astor, he put his young wife on one of the lifeboats and he was about to get in with her when he immediately saw two terrified children standing behind him. And it happened. He instead gave up his spot and let those other two children on the boat, which is just noble. It's brave. It's heroic. I, it's something that you ask yourself, could I do that? If it actually were to happen, would I have the willpower to do that? I hope so. This is absolute bravery. One of the Titanic survivors named Philip Mock saw John in one of his final moments later on after this brave moment. He saw him and his valet huddled together on one of the life rafts before they unfortunately froze in the cold water. It's tragic. This was indeed a very tragic event, but the positive news here is that both his wife and the child that she was carrying at the time were able to make it to safety and they survived the entire ordeal. While there are many terrible stories from this day, we also don't hear enough about the bravery that people showed during this tragic event. And finally, number one, Molly Brown. In total, there were 700 and six people who survived the sinking of the Titanic. Molly Brown has been referred to as the unsinkable Molly Brown. And when you look into her story, it really checks out. Margaret Brown not only survived the Titanic, which is just an incredible feat in itself, and it's the odds there are just incredible, but once aboard the life ship, she threatened the quartermaster. She said she'll throw him overboard if he didn't go back immediately and start looking for more survivors. That's bad. That, that is something I will do. I hope I can do in a moment like this. That's incredible. Historically, this is where the accounts get a little hazy. See, it's not confirmed whether the boat actually went back to look, but after narrowingly surviving a tragedy, then you're barely conscious. You still think of other people? That's the, that's the moral of the story here. Margaret was traveling in Egypt, but when a grandchild got sick, she ended her trip early just to go back to the States and take care of them. Once she got all this attention after surviving said disaster, she then campaigned publicly for women's rights and education for the poor. She was a bad ass in the boat and then a bad ass afterwards. Like, this is insane. There was a musical comedy in the 60s called The Unsinkable Molly Brown. So her name will be remembered for a while. 
as it should be. Thank you, Molly. Starting off this countdown, we have the birthday. This man is convinced that his younger brother was once on the Titanic. He says that when he was about three or four years old, he was terrified of water. So much so that he was terrified of taking a bath. When his brother asked him why he was afraid, he said, and I quote, I was on a big ship. We hit the biggest iceberg and then it was really busy. Then I got really cold and wet and I went to a warm, bright place and waited until my next family came. Woo! Okay, that's intense. Meanwhile, his brother claims that he's super young and has never seen the Titanic or even heard about it. The strangest thing about this, the Titanic sank April 15th, 1912. His brother was born April 15th, 1992. Same day, several years later. Moving on at number nine, we have the little girl. This next woman has very vivid memories of being a little girl on the Titanic. She states that she remembers the night that it all happened. Her parents were getting dressed up in fancy clothes. She was sitting on her bed in a frilly dress waiting for them. When they get to the dining room, a man with a mustache takes her hand and kisses it and says, and I quote, such a pretty little girl. Someday you're going to make a man very happy. In the middle of the night, she claims that she heard three people talking before her mom rushed into her room and told her nurse slash caretaker to put on her coat. They go out to the deck where they see people trying to get in lifeboats. She ends up on a boat with her mother, but they get back off of the boat to go find her father and the nurse. Eventually, they're stuck on the Titanic without a lifeboat, and she remembers it slowly sinking. She remembers sliding into the cold water and sinking down into it, where from there, everything just went black. In our eighth spot, we have the engagement ring. This next woman claims that when she was 12, she started getting memories of her being on the Titanic. She states that she would often be overwhelmed by a claustrophobic feeling and a rocking sensation, as if she was on a small room on a ship. Now, one day, she ended up watching a history program on the Titanic. That's when she would see clips of passengers aboard the Titanic. The woman would clearly recognize them and remember their names before the film even mentioned who they were. She eventually visited a Titanic exhibition in Copenhagen. When she saw the reconstruction of some of the cabins, she immediately felt ill and she felt that same walking sensation. Now, the freakiest part is when she saw a ring in the exhibition, which supposedly belonged to an unidentified female traveler. She immediately felt a connection to that ring and knew that it was her engagement ring. Coming in at number seven, we have Charles Lightroller. This next individual remembers being Charles Herbert Lightroller, a Royal Navy officer and the most senior member of the Titanic crew to survive the tragedy. This man remembers walking down the grand staircase and seeing all the beautiful gowns. He also remembers being on the Titanic's bridge. He always felt the connection to the Titanic and he knew that he was once on it. That's when he discovered a picture of Charles and immediately felt connected to it. He knew that that was himself. What's freaky is that in June of 2001, this man met a woman at a coffee shop while he was writing a novel about the Titanic. She came to him randomly and said, you my dear were on that ship. I see you as a tall, strongly built man wearing a dark jacket with brass buttons and a white cap with a black visor. She then proceeds to flip through one of his books he had, points to a photo of Charles and says, that's you. Okay, that is so creepy how this random woman knew. He eventually went to the Titanic exhibition in Seattle to try and bring back more memories. That's when he was flooded with them. He remembers seeing himself in a uniform and he could even hear the music playing while he saw couples dancing in the ballroom. In our sixth spot, we have Alfred Peacock. Two years after the Titanic sank, a little boy was born. While he was growing up, he had a bunch of visions surrounding the Titanic, which led him to believe that he was on the Titanic when it sank. He claims that he remembers being a two-year-old boy on the ship with his family, his mom and his little sister. When he got older, he began to remember more details, like staying in the third class cabin. He also recalled that his name started with the letter A and ended in ED, which led him to believe that his name might have been Alfred. Upon looking at the Titanic passenger list, he discovered that there was a boy named Alfred Peacock. Alfred was on the Titanic in the third class cabin with his mom and sister just like the boy claimed. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the devoted wife. When a woman named Amanda was just 19 years old, she began to have memories of her being on the Titanic. She remembers that she was a first class passenger named Julia traveling with her family. While aboard the Titanic, she met a fellow whose name is either Marcus or Mark. 
who eventually turned out to be her husband. They both met aboard the Titanic and fell in love fast. When the Titanic was sinking, they both managed to survive by getting a lifeboat. They stayed in contact afterwards and eventually got married. In fact, she was at an antique store one day and saw an antique silver mirror and brush set, which triggered the memory of her using one while getting ready for her wedding. What I find fascinating though is that Amanda claims she hasn't had a boyfriend because she feels like no one treats her as well as her past husband did. That is so cute. Like their love is just eternal. Like she still loves him many lives later. In our fourth spot, we have the dreams. Back when this individual was in third grade, she would have dreams of a bright room filled with fancy dressed people dancing. She remembers walking through the ballroom and seeing a grand staircase. Then she would wake up from the dream. She never thought anything of it until at school she watched a documentary on the Titanic. This documentary showed the ballroom exactly how she dreamt of it. Before this documentary, she never heard of the Titanic, let alone seen pictures of it. 20 years later, she finds that every time she has a cold shower, she starts to gasp as if she can't breathe. One time while in the shower, she closed her eyes and had a vision of her drowning in the cold waters. To this day, she occasionally has dreams or flashbacks to the time that she was aboard the ship. Coming in at number three, we have Bess Waldo Daniels. This next individual remembers being a woman named Bess Waldo Daniels aboard the Titanic. She discovered that she was Bess when she saw a picture of Bess's husband and children and realized that they looked exactly like the individuals from her own visions. She remembers the early life as Bess, the memories from her childhood, all the way up to the day that she passed away on the Titanic. She had a husband named Hudson and three children, Helen, Hudson, and Lorraine. She remembers being in their stateroom when her husband came in and told them to follow him out to the boat deck. She remembers him saying that it's not safe to take the elevator, so they had to take the stairs. She then gets in a boat with her baby while sounds of panic fill the air. In the boat, she was with complete strangers. She handed her baby to one man with curly blonde hair while she stood up to look for her husband. Then, all she remembers is that the boat rocked and she fell into the icy cold waters. In her second spot, we have Bridget O'Sullivan. A woman named Jackie is adamant that she was once a woman named Bridget O'Sullivan, who was a passenger on the Titanic. She remembers being a third class passenger. When the Titanic was sinking, she was in a small room with something blocking the door, making her trapped inside the room. She remembers seeing the water pour in through the door. The ship tipped and a large trunk slid and hit her left hip. The room fills with water and she drowns. Turns out Bridget O'Sullivan was a real person who indeed was a passenger on the Titanic. In fact, when Jackie found a picture of Bridget, she claims that they both looked identical when they were the same age. And in our number one spot, we have the boy named Jamie. Now, Jamie's story was even featured on the show Ghost Inside My Child, which is a show about children who may have been reincarnated. Now, ever since Jamie was little, he had a huge fear of water, which is weird considering that his whole family loves swimming and water. He would only go as far as standing on the pool's steps, and he would freak out if he went any further in. His family also claims that he would suffer from terrible night terrors, where he would basically wake up panicked and would sprint around the house into each room as if he was trapped and trying to find his way out. This would happen almost every night. Now, it doesn't stop there. One time when Jamie was learning to ride his bike, he said he remembers seeing his mom ride her blue bike. Well, apparently when his mom was little, she would ride a blue bike, but never when she was older. When his mom asked how he knew this, he said, there are windows in heaven, mama. Whew. There were also other unusual things about Jamie. Around the age of four, he would say port and starboard instead of left and right. And he would also say some words with a slight English accent. One day, Jamie ended up watching the ending of the Titanic thanks to his babysitter. And this heightened everything. From there, he would constantly draw images of the ship. Some containing great detail showing the different levels and all the rooms. He even knew facts about the ship that a five-year-old possibly couldn't have known. Like how one time he drew a ship with four smokestacks, but he only drew smoke coming out of three. His mom asked him why one wasn't working and he said, that's a dummy stack, it's just for show. And this is true, apparently they only used three of the smokestacks but thought four looked better, so one was just fake. Now, Jamie also would be overcome by guilt constantly. 
he repeatedly would tell his mom that the tragedy shouldn't have happened, and he said, and I quote, mistakes were made and corners were cut. He said that the men in the boiler rooms shouldn't have been trapped. He also said that the bow should have been made out of iron instead of steel. This, among all the other facts, led his mom to believe that his son helped build the ship or was a worker aboard the ship. Starting off with number 10 are the Navitro brothers, aka the Titanic orphans. This one is equally sad and equally scandalous. Michelle Jr. and Edmund Navratil were going through a rough time for any three and two year olds. Their parents separated in 1912 and their mum Marcel had full custody of them but would let their dad Michelle see them on weekends. When she went to pick up the boys after Easter weekend, she found the house empty and the boys nowhere to be found. What happened was that Michelle kidnapped the boys and boarded the Titanic wanting to immigrate to the US and start a new chapter with his kids and genuinely hoping his ex-wife would follow. I mean if you want your ex-wife to follow I feel like kidnapping is not the best start. The three came on as second class passengers with fake names, Michelle as Louis M. Hoffman and the boys as Lola and Momin. When the ship was going down, Michelle put his kids in collapsible boat D and sadly did not survive himself. Since the boys were young and spoke no English whatsoever, they couldn't identify themselves either and were dubbed the Titanic orphans until their mother was finally located. They were the only children that survived the Titanic that were rescued without a parent or guardian present. Can you just imagine the trauma they went through that they will pos pretty much never get over. That's a lifelong trauma. Coming in at number 9 is the wealth gap. There were three classes of passengers aboard the ship as we already know. First class to third, the riches are in first class and vice versa. The Titanic did a brilliant job of at least making the third class passengers feel more privileged by giving them closed off private rooms as opposed to a dormitory type situation. But the same can't be said about rescue crews who were doing damage control on the ship. In order to prioritize the remains of the first and second class passengers, they literally just started throwing the bodies of third class passengers passengers into the ocean. The evidence was written in excruciating detail in a series of telegrams between the White Star Line and the recovery ship tasked with the issue. So while most of the second and first class passengers bodies were returned to their families and were given proper burials, most of the third class families were kept in the dark about their loved ones. Plot twist, the wage gap didn't get any better. A hundred years later. Spit facts only. At number 8 we have ignored. So the death count of the crash was estimated to be between 1500 to 1635 people out of the 2224 people on board altogether. Now most of them died of hypothermia after the sinking while they were waiting in vain to be rescued from the freezing water. But the casualties could have been so much lower because 20 miles away the SS Californian was floating idle waiting for the ice to clear. I bet they wanted to be them right about then. The captain of the ship even saw all of Titanic's crisis flares but ignored them because he assumed they were just simply company rockets. Bruh, I would have come back from the dead just to be like, bro, what the F are you doing, bro? We're out here dying. All the SOS signals weren't received till the next day, so by the time the Californian dragged its there, they found nothing but bodies. Too little, too late. Filling on number 7 slot are the tears. Now the commonly believed fact is that the iceberg essentially caused the Titanic to split in half. We saw it in the movie, we saw people sliding to the other side of the ship. It was all happening, and we saw it. Now before actually discovering the wreckage of the ship, experts believe there was only one 300 foot tear in the middle of the ship. Plot twist, it wasn't. But after examining the wreckage, it was a whole other ball game. There were actually six separate tears going through the ship, all totaling 15 feet. But I mean, I had no idea that was a big enough hole to sink a ship that was almost 900 feet long. Almost. 882 nearly there. Now at number 6 is the trusted captain. The captain of the Titanic was Edward Smith and he obviously caught a lot of slack for being the captain of the ship that endured the worst maritime tragedy ever but in reality he wasn't that bad. Smith was one of the most seasoned sea captains out there so much so he even had fans and a low key cult following. Some passengers wouldn't even go on Atlantic voyages unless Smith was the captain of the vessel. So for a captain with that kind of reputation to then go down in history for his folly on the 
night of the crash is just crazy to me, like mind blown. Coming in at number five is the full moon. Now when it comes down to blame, we can blame the lookouts for not doing their job properly, we can blame lack of visibility, but scientists believe the real blame for the tragedy is the moon. Wind causes waves for the most part, but it's the gravitational pull of the sun and moon on earth that causes proper tidal waves. So based on that, researchers have concluded that the full moon on the 4th of January 1912 could have caused the abnormally strong tides that move the big iceberg southward right in time to hit the Titanic on her maiden voyage. That was the closest lunar approach the earth had experienced since the year 796, so I feel like they ain't wrong. They ain't wrong. And number four is a premonition. So 14 years prior to Titanic's maiden voyage, the author Morgan Robertson wrote a novella called Futility and the subject matter was a sinking ship. That ship was called the Titan and the whole story had eerily similar details to the Titanic. In Futility, Titan is the largest ship of its time and so was the Titanic. In reality, they were both roughly the same size, the Titanic being 25 meters longer and both were described as unsinkable and both hit an iceberg mid-April. Both ships even carried the bare legal minimum number of lifeboats aboard despite having a ton of passengers. I mean even the names of both ships are two letters off, like are we just, are we just gonna ignore that? I don't think we should. Morgan was accused of being psychic, but he replied saying, I know what I'm writing about, that's all. He was an experienced seaman, he knew his subject matter well, and that's all it was. And although I believe Morgan, it's still just very creepy. Filling on number three slot is Till Death Do Us Part. Now amongst the many important passengers aboard the ship, two of them were Isidore and Ida Strauss, the magnates of Macy's, the department store. As the ship started going down, the attendants were rushing Ida into a lifeboat, but she flat out refused to leave Isidore behind and Isidore himself refused to leave on a lifeboat and leave any men behind on the ship. So the couple decided to sacrifice themselves and go down together. The last thing she was heard saying was, I will not be separated from my husband. As we have lived, so will we die together. And the last time they were seen was on the deck, arms wrapped around each other in that last embrace. Now that is a real ride or die right there. All your other ride or dies, fake. Cancel it. Done. It's them two. Name a better duo, I'll wait. Now at number two is the fatal turn. So I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty of what happened and who was contacted when the iceberg was spotted because I feel like we've talked about that part of it to death. Now let me set the scene. When the chief officer on the bridge received that iceberg warning, the first thing he did was tell the hemsman to turn the wheel and that was the biggest mistake he could have made. Researchers who've studied the ship's trajectory have concluded that the collision could have been completely avoided had the order to turn not been made. The Titanic was actually equipped with collision bulkhead in the bow, so had the ship hit the iceberg head on, it would have most likely survived. The damages that would have incurred from the head on impact would have either slowed down the sinking considerably, giving people more time to board lifeboats, or it would have saved the ship entirely. That guy was probably like, I made a grave mistake. And that you have. And finally, at number one is the show must go on. This was just so heartbreaking to me, but I felt like I just had to share it with you guys. I'm sorry if it's a downer. So Dorothy Gibson, a well-known actress of the time, was actually aboard the Titanic and experienced a terrible tragedy for herself. She thankfully survived the incident, but her producers were hounding her to star in a film about the sinking of the Titanic weeks after the crash happened. Like, can we take a moment? Can we take a moment? Dorothy refused to star in Save from the Titanic countless times, but she kept being pressurized into it because producers were convinced that the film would do amazing. The whole thing was shot in a week, with Dorothy having multiple breakdowns during filming and having fits of hysterical crying. When it was finally released less than a month after the real event, it did horribly. It bombed. Critics thought it was so insensitive that someone would make a movie about one of the worst maritime tragedies, not even a month after it happened. And the fact that Gibson somehow survived filming it was also beyond them. They took too soon to a whole other level. Level. That is way too soon. Starting us off at number 10, we have the final resting place. When it comes to Titanic related hauntings, it should come as no big surprise that the actual site where the tragedy occurred is considered one of the most haunted spots of all. According to those who have visited since the fateful day, strange sights such as odd glowing orbs of light can be seen floating around at night, and many believe they are actually the spirit spirits of those who died at sea. But that's not all. Deep sea vessels that have explored the area near the sinking have reported to receive eerie, 
faint SOS calls that fade in and out and seem to have no traceable source. Could they be the ghosts of the fallen crying out for help? Many definitely believe so. Now, orbs of light and radio static are nowhere near unheard of when it comes to suspected paranormal activity, especially when you're dealing with a place such as this where so many people have perished. However, the most terrifying curse of all has to do with an old legend that says if you aren't careful, the lonely ghosts in the sea may just pull you overboard to live the rest of eternity with them. So just be safe if you are sailing in the area. Coming in at number nine, Titanic's Builder. Inside the Titanic exhibit in the Luxor Hotel is a portrait of a man named J. Bruce Ismay, who was one of the builders of the Titanic many years ago. However, the thing about Ismay was that he's not really what you would describe as a hero. Apparently, he fled the sinking ship, leaving women and their families behind, and witnesses on the lifeboats claim he kept his back to the ship as it descended. But worst of all, it said he was the one insisting the ship speed up after receiving ice warnings. And as a result, it's believed he is not terribly liked by the ghosts who did not survive the disaster. In fact, one morning in particular, as the crew came in to open the exhibit, they found the portrait of Ismay on the floor. When the manager watched the surveillance video from the night before, he was stunned to see the picture began shaking before coming off of the wall seemingly all by itself. Many believe that those who perished that night haunt the exhibit, tearing down his photo. And some believe that if you aren't careful, they may just curse you for being associated with him. Coming in at number eight, no Pope. So this next one is kind of a full conspiracy, but you know what? I just couldn't help myself. Apparently one of the myths that supports the idea that the ship was cursed comes from the ship's number. The number in question was allegedly 390904, but some Catholic employees who built the ship were distressed at the time as the number when viewed in a mirror appears to say no pope. Apparently this meant that the ship was cursed and godless in their eyes, and that coupled with someone allegedly saying that God could not sink the ship made for one giant cursed vessel. To be honest, I'm not sure how much of this myth is based in fact and how much of it is a glorified legend, but I'm not out to tempt fate in the same way the Titanic did all those years ago. Coming in at number seven, Ghost of the Titanic. One can assume that there are as many ghosts as there were fatalities associated with the infamous sinking of the ship, but one of the most famous is thought to be that of Frederick Fleet. Frederick was a British sailor serving as the lookout aboard the RMS Titanic, and it was Frederick who actually spotted the deadly iceberg and warned the bridge. But tragically, as we know, his warning came too late and the ship was not able to avoid the disastrous collision. However, the saddest part was that although Fleet survived the sinking of the Titanic, he suffered deeply from depression in part to his survivor's guilt. And tragically, his depression only grew worse over time. Finally, after his wife's passing just after Christmas in 1964 and the shortly followed eviction from his brother-in-law, Frederick took his own life. Following his death, he was buried, but strangely, his grave remained unmarked until the Titanic Historical Society erected a headstone for him in 1993. These days, however, it appears his spirit is not quite at rest, as witnesses have claimed to see him keeping watch over the Las Vegas exhibition's promenade deck, perhaps driven by his guilt to watch even in the afterlife. Next up at number six, a ghost on board. Back in 1977, second officer Leonard Bishop of the SS Winterhaven gave a tour of the ship to a man who he naturally assumed was a passenger. Apparently the man was British and very soft spoken, but extremely interested in every detail of the vessel, almost unusually so. Bishop found the man to be a bit strange, but didn't think much of it and continued to tour him around. But it wasn't until a few years later when he saw a photo of Titanic Captain Edward John Smith that Officer Bishop realized why the situation felt so off. Allegedly, he exclaimed to a friend, I know him, I gave him a tour of my boat. But the friend laughed and explained to his friend that the man had been long dead and that the man he claimed to know was the captain of the Titanic. 
Turns out the captain still remains at sea and likes to check up on the passing boats. Let's just hope he's not looking to be vengeful. Coming in at number 5, Lady in Black. Almost any haunted location has some kind of Lady in Black. I'm not sure exactly why, but it just happens to be part of the brand. And the Titanic Artifact Exhibition is no exception. Employees and guests alike all claim to have seen this mysterious woman. And it's said she wears a black period dress with a white collar and her hair in a bun. However, the most eerie of stories surrounding this ghost has to do with a photographer. Reportedly, he was getting ready for the opening of an exhibition when he spotted this woman casually walking down the grand staircase. He was understandably startled as he hadn't noticed anyone enter and the staircase was roped off, but he just assumed he must have missed her come in and that she was a part of the exhibit. So trying to be friendly, he asked if she'd like him to photograph her, but she ignored him. So he went back to setting up, but suddenly she was directly behind him. So again, he offered a photograph, but this time she didn't just ignore him, she vanished right before his very eyes. It's believed she is a ghost of a woman who died on the ship, and while no one knows exactly who she might be, let's just hope she's not a dangerous spirit. Next up at number 4, A Premonition. As the legend goes, on the very same night the ship went down, a young Scottish woman by the name of Jessie was on the verge of dying. It's said that in her delirious state, she supposedly spoke of a massive sinking ship and a man named Wally playing a fiddle, despite the fact that she would have no way of knowing the Titanic would sink that night. Unless she was placing some kind of curse, that is. I have to say the most insane part of the legend is that a man named Wallace, aka Wally Hartley, did indeed play his violin one last time as he and his band went down with the ship. Let's just hope some women on her deathbed wasn't the reason this all happened. Coming in at number 3, The Unlucky Mummy. One of the most well known alleged curses surrounding the Titanic is that of the unlucky mummy. Now, for a little context, approximately a thousand years before the time of Christ, a woman who has since been dubbed a priestess of the College of Amun Ra was born in the city of Thebes, Egypt. And it is believed this mummy is her embalmed body. Now, in terms of the unluckiness surrounding her mummy, in the late 1890s, archaeologists discovered the burial site during a dig near Egypt's lost city of Luxor. According to legend, a rich Englishman arranged for the purchase of the mummy and her casket. However, as reported by the Museum of Unnatural History, the man inexplicably vanished before his purchase could be delivered. Then later, all three of his travel companions suffered misfortune. One of the men died, another was disabled in an accident, and the third suffered financial ruin. From that day forward, it was believed that anyone or anything that this mummy came into contact with would be cursed by misfortune, and rumors suggest that the mummy was eventually purchased by an American archaeologist who arranged for it to be transported to the United States aboard the Titanic. So for all we know, some ancient cursed mummy could have cursed the ship and sent it to its dark fate. Coming in at number 2, Missing Tourists. If there was ever an argument to be made for scary curses surrounding the Titanic, then this next story is probably the one I would pick. You may or may not have seen and heard the terrifying story that is unfolding as we speak, but essentially there was a tourist submarine that set out to tour the wreckage of the Titanic that has now been missing for over 48 hours. The missing vessel has five people on board, including British billionaire Hamish Harding, French diver Paul-Henri Nargolat, Pakistani entrepreneur Shadza Dawood with his son, and the final passenger is believed to be Stockton Rush, the founder of Ocean Gate Expeditions. The submarine dove down on Sunday morning, but after only an hour and 45 minutes into the tour, they lost all communication. Now, besides the obviously nerve wracking part of this all, what is really scary is that, according to Ocean Gate's website, the submarine can only last for up to 96 hours underwater with five people consuming oxygen. So the clock is ticking for the search and rescue team to try and track down the disappearing vessel before it's too late. 
It is truly a horrific and nightmare inducing situation and many believe that the waters surrounding the haunted ship are to blame. And last up in our number one spot today is the wreck of the Titan. There are many conspiracy theories surrounding the Titanic, one being that it never actually set sail, another being that it deliberately sunk, but to be honest, none of them really hold much validity. However, there is one interesting conspiracy theory, and that is that a man named Morgan Robertson actually predicted and potentially even cursed the infamous ship when he published his novel The Wreck of the Titan in 1898, 14 years before the real life disaster. Now, to be clear, Robertson rejected any claim stating that he had something to do with the disaster and insisted he was just drawing on his own real life experiences as a sailor. But I have to admit, some of the similarities between his story and the real life events are a little creepy. For example, even if you ignore that they had similar names, the fictitious Titan, like the Titanic, was supposed to be the largest of its kind and an unsinkable ship. Plus, it also lacked enough lifeboats to accommodate its passenger load, and struck an iceberg while going too fast in the North Atlantic. And as if that weren't strangely similar enough, both disasters took place in April and cost thousands of people their lives. So do you think this book was some kind of curse on the ship or just a really creepy coincidence? In our number 10 spot today we have musical instruments. Two parts of a destroyed clarinet as well as a violin that was played by bandmaster Wallace Hartley were found among the wreckage of the Titanic. I know musical instruments aren't exactly a terrifying discovery, but the discovery reminds us of the heartbreaking story of the Titanic's band. As the Titanic sank, it is famously known that the band played on despite the absolutely horrific incident that was taking place around them. At first it was widely believed that they did this because they were ordered to, and for the record, if this were the case, that still would have been insanely brave of them. But as it turns out, this is far from true. The band members were in fact not ship employees, which means that they had the same rights as any passengers to leave. So why didn't they? Well, it is now widely believed that it most likely was so that they could use their music to help calm people so that they wouldn't panic. That's some major bravery right there. In our number nine spot today we have a men's shoe. This artifact is one of the rarest to be shown of the items that have been recovered from the Titanic wreckage because of the fact that it is in such poor condition. All that remains of the shoe are the welt, top cap, and just a touch of the insole. This artifact does a couple things. It reminds you of the very real humans who became victims of this tragedy, and it also reminds you of the unrelenting nature of the ocean. Seeing the personal belongings of the passengers, regardless of knowing who specifically the shoe belonged to in their story, just adds a personal element, like you almost knew them. And then seeing how torn up the shoe has become is a strong reminder to us all that we truly are no match for mother nature, and the ocean is one of the most powerful and frightening things on the earth. In our number 8 spot today we have a love letter. Richard Geddes was a cabin attendant on the Titanic who wrote a love letter to his wife while aboard, but unfortunately she would never go on to receive it. The letter was written on the original Titanic stationery, and it even had its original white star line envelope when it was found. While this story in itself is of course extremely sad, and again one of those reminders of the human side of those who were in this incident, this letter also contained something else beside utterings and confessions of love. It also featured a description that Richard wrote for his wife of a near collision that the Titanic had with the SS City of New York, obviously prior to the terrible iceberg incident. There were people who had witnessed this near collision and believed that it was a bad omen for the Titanic. In our number 7 spot today we have a pocket watch. Okay. This artifact most certainly isn't the scariest one on today's list, but the story behind who it belonged to is one for the books. Sinai Cantor was 34 years old when he was a passenger on the Titanic. On board with him was his wife Miriam, and the pair were from Russia. They purchased second class passenger tickets, which at the time cost them £26, which is about $3,666 in today's money. When tragedy struck and the Titanic was sinking, Sinai immediately thought of his wife. He was able to get her aboard one of the life rafts thankfully, and as far as I know, she was rescued from the icy waters. Unfortunately, the same could not be said for him, however, as he ended up being one of those who passed away in the sinking of the ship. During rescue efforts, this pocket watch ended up being recovered from his body. In our number 6 spot today, we have the inspection card. This inspection card once belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. What could possibly be worrisome about an inspection card? Well, it shows how Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found her 
herself as one of the passengers. The card shows that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic. For some reason, the trip she originally had planned was delayed and she instead was assigned to the ill-fated Titanic. You can see that the word Majestic was crossed out on her card which shows us the change in plans. If only people were able to see what was about to strike and could have warned her. In our number 5 spot today we have the Titanic radio. Okay. Don't yell at me. This is a piece of the ship that has not yet been recovered, but it's the focus of much debate on whether or not it should be retrieved from the wreckage. Known in 1912 as the Marconi Wireless Telegraph Machine, the radio on the Titanic sent distress calls to nearby ships that ended up saving the lives of 700 people in lifeboats. Despite how many people died in the Titanic tragedy, many of their bodies have never been recovered, which is why there were debates about whether or not to retrieve the artifact because of the fact that there might still be remains located in the same area as the radio is. Lawyers have argued against the recovery of the radio because the dive plan did not include the prospect of there being human remains located down there. It also was argued because in order to retrieve it, they would need to cut into the ship's radio compartment, which was strongly opposed by preservation advocates. As of right now, it appears as though the dive to retrieve the radio will still occur, but it isn't exactly clear when. This radio would be a very valuable artifact, but it also would hold an eerie tale of exactly when and how the radio was used during the final moments of the Titanic. In our number 4 spot today we have the telegraph. Separate from the radio we just talked about, the ship's telegraph machine was recovered in 1987 and this was used to relay commands to the engine room. So it was used as a communication device on board rather than to communicate with other ships. This telegraph machine is likely the one that was used to communicate to turn away from the iceberg in the North Atlantic Ocean. Unfortunately these commands came way too late as the ship struck the iceberg only 37 seconds after it was finally seen, and we all know what happened next. This telegraph was actually part of a Titanic auction that featured over 5,000 recovered artifacts that were selling for a combined some $200 million. In our number 3 spot today we have the bell. The bell from the crow's nest of the Titanic was recovered from the wreckage and returned to land where it now resides in the Titanic Museum. The eerie story behind this bell is that it would have been the one that was rung three times by the lookout. Frederick Fleet in order to attempt to warn of the iceberg that was ahead. Frederick, as well as the other lookout who was with him, Reginald Lee, both ended up thankfully surviving the incident and went on to later explain what happened from their point of view. They explained that if they had been given binoculars to assist with their job, they could have seen the iceberg sooner. When asked how much sooner, Frederick replied, well, enough to get out of the way. In our number 2 spot today we have the big piece. This was a 15 ton section of the Titanic that ended up being recovered from the ocean floor. Floor. The wreckage of the Titanic was not found until 1985 when oceanographer Robert Ballard was doing a secret underwater expedition. The big piece is about 26 by 12 feet and it was once a section of the ship's starboard side hull. This piece also has a part of the original support beam that attached this piece to the frame of the ship. It is said that where this piece was located on the ship, basically everything else around it was absolutely obliterated when the ship split in two. This artifact is said to be the reminder of the most violent violent aspect of the sinking of the ship, which is a horrifying thought. It was found among many other smaller pieces of the ship that had all been broken up. In our number 1 spot today we have this cherub statue. In the remnants of the Titanic, they recovered a broken cherub statue that once found its home on the grand staircase of the Titanic. Aside from cherubs just being kind of creepy in general, there's something exceptionally eerie about this piece of religious iconography being at the center of such a huge disaster, as well as being found among the wreckage years later. Cherubs are usually known as bearers of the throne or creatures who attend to God, so it's just a little creepy to have one at the scene of a terrible disaster, as well as it making through all of the years and years that the Titanic was underwater waiting to be found. Starting off in our number 10 spot we have the heads up. I'm not sure why, but for actual years, I thought that on the day of the Titanic sinking, the iceberg they hit just kind of came out of nowhere and surprised them, so imagine my surprise when I found out that wasn't true even in the slightest. It turns out the entire thing could have been avoided. The crew had received six warnings about the iceberg before the collision. While the first few warnings were received by the captain, not all of them were, and it's not 
totally clear why. Although the crew knew about the icy conditions on the water, they didn't slow down much, which some have called a reckless decision, but apparently this was standard practice at the time, so I suppose you can't really blame them. The final warning, however, was received from a ship that had halted for the night due to an ice field a few miles away, and when the message was being relayed to the captain, he cut it off and said to shut up as he was working Cape Race. In our number 9 spot today, we have the futility. This is more so something that happened prior to the fateful day of the Titanic sinking, but it's still quite unsettling and also kind of bizarre nonetheless. In 1898, a book called Futility was released by an author named Morgan Robertson. This book tells the story of a large ship named the Titan. The Titan sets out for its first sail but encounters and strikes an iceberg. This certainly sounds eerily familiar, doesn't it? Considering this book was released in 1898 and the real life event of the Titanic sinking happened in 1912, there are many people who believe that this novel predicted this fateful day. It's most likely a very strange coincidence, but man is it really weird. Even with the names being so close, let alone how the rest of the story just matches up so well. Maybe Morgan Robertson is a time traveler or some kind of prophet, but if he was to guess it would be kind of rude to just write a book about it rather other than, I don't know, warn someone? In our number 8 spot today we have True Love. Two of the first class passengers who were on the ship were elderly couple Isidore and Ida Stratus. When the ships started to sink and lifeboats were being boarded, attendants were ushering Ida into one of the lifeboats, but of course without her husband since women and children were being rescued first. Ida however refused to leave her husband and Isidore refused to be rescued before other men. Instead they both chose to stay on the ship and they went down together. Ida said quote, I will not be separated from my husband. As we have lived, so we will die together. Survivors who witnessed their love last saw the pair standing on the deck with their arms around each other. This love story is incredibly tragic, but also just such a testament to how much they loved each other. I am very glad that they had one another in those very frightening moments. In our number 7 spot today, we have Take My Spot. John Jacob Astor was one of the first class passengers on the ship that day. As the ship was sinking, he put his young wife on one of the lifeboats and he was about to get in with her when he saw two absolutely terrified children standing beside behind him. He instead gave up his spot and let those two children on the boat, which is both noble, but it's also just the right thing to do. One of the Titanic survivors named Philip Mock saw John in one of his final moments. He saw him and his valet huddled together on one of the life rafts before they unfortunately froze in the cold water. This was indeed a very tragic event, but the positive news is that both his wife and the child she was carrying at the time were able to make it to safety and survive the whole ordeal, which also likely means that the children he gave his spot up for also survived. While there are many terrible stories from this day, we also hear quite a few about the bravery people showed during this tragic event. In our number 6 spot today we have the lifeboat. Before the Titanic set sail during the preparation for the journey, at some point people made a decision to reduce the number of lifeboats that were on board. They did this because they didn't want to clutter the deck, which is truly trivial when we are talking about the safety of the 2,208 passengers that were on board that day. The number of lifeboats boats ended up being reduced to just 20 with an additional 4 that were collapsible. This meant that, should they have had time to launch every single one, this would still only be enough for half of the passengers on board. That's a terrible ratio. And as you may or may not know, during the sinking of the ship, not even all of the lifeboats were able to be launched as everything happened too quickly. There are quite a few lessons that can be and definitely were learned from the sinking of the Titanic, because the more we learn, the more we realize that the safety precautions taken for the ship simply were just not up to par. In our number 5 spot today we have the card. In the remnants of the Titanic, there was an inspection card found that belonged to a woman named Marion Meanwell. This may seem like a mundane find, but it revealed a very grim story for the woman. Once the card was found, it was revealed that Marion was not intended to be on the Titanic that day, but by some turn of events, she unfortunately found herself as one of the passengers. The card showed that she was originally meant to be traveling on a ship called the Majestic. For some reason, the trip she originally had planned was delayed and she instead was assigned to the ill-fated Titanic. You can see that the word Majestic was crossed out on her card, which shows us the change in plans. There clearly is no way anyone could have known or warned her, it's just a really tragic situation all around. In our number 4 spot today we have slow action. While we were just talking about lifeboats, I mentioned how there wasn't enough time to launch all of the ones on board. This is true, and while the Titanic sank fairly quickly, there would have been more 
more time if only people were more prepared. What I mean is that from the point where the ship actually hit the iceberg until the first lifeboats were launched was an entire hour. That is way too long when it is an emergency of this magnitude, which obviously leaves us wondering why. Well, as it turns out, a lot of people thought that the alarm bells were actually just a drill and they stayed inside where it was warm. This is already terrible, but what's even worse is that for the people who didn't think it was a drill, they had absolutely no idea where to go or what to do in the case of an emergency. They had never done any lifeboat drills so everyone was just panicking with nowhere to go. Due to this lifeboat delay, there wasn't enough time to launch all of the remaining lifeboats successfully. This means that there are likely many lives that could have been saved had they had some more direction or prior training. In our number three spot today, we have ignored help. Only 20 miles away from the location of the sinking of the Titanic was another boat called the SS Californian. This boat had stopped in order to avoid the ice, which was clearly a fantastic idea. What is pretty insane, however, is that the captain of this boat actually saw the emergency flares being set off on the Titanic, but he ignored them because he figured they were company rockets. And to make this matter even worse, the SOS signals that the Titanic was sending out weren't even received until the next day because the radio operator on the SS Californian had gone to sleep. By the time they heard these calls and arrived the next day, everyone had unfortunately already passed away and they weren't able to save anyone. Who knows what could have happened had they taken those emergency signals seriously? It's obviously not their fault, but it definitely makes you think. In our number two spot today, we have the band. We know how passionate musicians can be, and we know how healing music is for a lot of people. While I am absolutely sure that there was nothing that could be done to completely erase people's worries about what was going on, the ship's orchestra did what they could, which was to play music. The eight orchestra members continued to play as the ship sank in order to try and keep spirits up, I'm sure for other passengers as well as themselves. At first, it was widely believed that they did this because they were ordered to, and for the record, if this were the case, that would still have been insanely brave of them, but as it turns out, this is far from true. The band members were in fact not ship employees, which means that they had the same rights as any passenger to leave, but they chose not to. They all unfortunately passed away in the sinking of the ship and they played until they couldn't anymore, which I think is horribly sad, but also very beautiful and heroic of them. I'm sure that their heroism helped a lot of people who were also in this terrible situation, and I'm glad that their acts have been remembered even still. In our number one spot today, we have Wrong Turn. Okay, so we talked about how many warnings about the iceberg were ignored, but what happened when people finally stopped ignoring them? Well, once the iceberg was actually spotted, the chief officer received this warning and he ordered the helmsman to turn the wheel. Apparently this was actually a huge mistake, but it's unlikely they would have known that at the time. Researchers now believe that if they hadn't turned the wheel, the ship might not have sunk. The ship itself had bulkheads in the bow, so it is very likely that had the ship collided head on with the iceberg, it actually would have been fine. They said that a head on collision would have either stopped the ship from sinking at all, or it would have at least sunk a lot more slowly which would have given more time for people to be rescued. It's easy for us to look back and say this would have been the best move, but under that kind of pressure, it's tough to see things as clearly as we can right now. If you enjoyed these Titanic discoveries, then you have to check out this video next. It's about solar eclipse predictions that might come true today. Wow, check out this video now.